have a lot of people out camping. Obviously, I was down at the church camp down uh, south of Hayes, Harlem, and there, there was a pretty healthy number of the campers down there who were from Haver, and so uh, some of them came back. I did. I came back last night to be here with you, and I, we're just going to have a great time singing these songs of praise, and that uh, as we do that, that it would be from your heart. I just pray that that would happen today. Would you please stand as we begin singing, As You Are Able. Good to see you online, too. Go ahead and greet someone. You might have to walk a ways, but go ahead. We're going to sing another, as a group here, a uh, old-time favorite, the Solid Rock. Please, again, stand as you are able. Here we go. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sands. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his faith, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. 
On Christ the solid rock I stand. shall come with trumpet sound oh may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone fall to lust to stand before you know the words now on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other Father, we do thank you for this time that we can come together, and as those people are traveling, uh, be it the Labor Day weekend, that they would be to remember you, be it they at church or uh, whatever group that they're in, that they would be a day of remembrance of what you have done for each and every one of us. Pray for each person here, the willingness to come out and to uh, encourage one another, and we just pray that would happen today, that we would be encouraged, that we'd be blessed, and that you, uh, you would be the, here with your Holy Spirit, and that we would know that. I thank you for uh, the, the group here that we have assembled, that it would be for your glory. And as Rick brings the sermon, that it would be things that uh, we could apply to our lives. And uh, first Sunday of the month where we can practice the communion time together, that again, you bring that unity and it would just be for your glory. And again, we continue on here. Just pray that these songs would be uh, a, a sweet sound to your ears. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. 
ahead and go into our prayer time. If you have a prayer concern or a prayer praise, there will be people around the room, also in the bulletins, if you wish to write it down and have it there. Good morning. It's good to see you. Need you pretty pleased to grab your worship folders. There's an outline in there for you to fill out today. And turn to Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 42. All right, Acts 2, 42. And then if you are able to multitask, if you would um, 
slip over. You got your Bibles open? We're going to read from Acts 2.42 here in just a moment. But later on in the sermon, we're going to read from 1 John chapter 1. And if you have that ready to go, that would be a good idea, all right? So if you got a, I bet you've got an old worship folder or something in your Bible somewhere. Yeah, it happens. Anyway, have Acts 2.42 ready for right now. Find 1 John 1, stick something there so we can get to it in a hurry later on. We're in the third week of a relatively short series called Fresh Start. Today we're going to talk about connecting to community. The whole idea that we're looking at in this is because God is who God is, we want to prepare for a blessing because that's the kind of God he is. Um, there's certain things that mark his church and we're going to talk about one of those today. Acts 2 beginning with verse 42. We ready? Look up, smile. By the way, it's really good to see you. It would be real easy to comment about all the people who are family camp or camping or whatever. That, that, that. But thank you for choosing to be here today. And I pray that you're blessed by his word. All right. Acts 2 verse 42. Talking about the early church. And it says they, if you got a pen, un underline this, the second word. They devoted. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions of good they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We've got a little bit of an echo. Matt is working really, really hard to get rid of that. So if, it's, if you've got a ringing in your ears, it's not you. It's happening, all right? When we read Acts 2... Um, I don't know. It's pretty cool. That's all there is to it. What it, it, it stands out. It's a church that I, it's a setting that we'd love to be a part of, to, to see God actively working like that. And, and I, there's a bit of kind of a, an awe or maybe a miss in our own hearts. Like what keeps it from happening like that today? Or a more positive twist what would have to happen to allow him to work like that? Because after all, he's still God. And again and again, his word would say one of the keys is biblical fellowship, what we might call authentic community. And when we hold something like that up directly from his word, we ought to, we ought to be brave enough to ask, how do we rank in that? What do, what do we have to do to get somewhere like this? And I got a great diagnostic question to ask each of you. One question to help accurately assess your capability to envision the biblical concept of community in our contemporary cultural setting. Here's the question How old is your grandma? Not who's your mama. How old is your grandma? Think about it. If you are of an age that you snorted when I asked that question, if your first response was, my grandma, what are you talking about? Rick, I'm a grandparent myself. I'm a great-grandparent. If that was your response, then you might have a clue today. If you said, well, Rick, I think my grandma's about your age, then I'm going to tell you you're going to have a hard time grasping this concept fully because I doubt if you or your parents or maybe even their parents have anything in their lives, in their personal experience to measure it against. I can remember my grandma who has been gone over 20 years now and she was at least 80 when she died. I can remember her telling me about growing up as a girl along the Cumberland River in Tennessee it was a time of extreme hardship, and it fostered a mutual dependence among people and families, communities, and churches. 
You could not get along without having others actively involved in your life. People had to pool resources in order to simply survive. Times were hard, but there was a, a closeness among people that we do not experience today. They worked together, they ate together, and actually talked to their neighbors. Going to church was an all-day event that included a picnic and usually a, a pulling together to, specific, to specifically help somebody in need. Even, it was a different time. Even the architecture of the homes was different. We've talked about this before. The porch was more than a step or a means to enter the home. There were chairs and a, and a swing that were seen and used as more than just a decorative item. People would stop and talk. They, they'd come up on the porch and, and, and sit a spell, you know. Lemonade or something to that effect would be offered and shared even if it was in short supply because guests were honored. Almost all the homes had porches and people sat outside in the evening because they didn't have air conditioning. Friends would stop by, catch this, they would stop by unannounced to visit. There was a connectiveness among neighbors and families. Today, it's a different story. You would feel very awkward, awkward stopping over to someone's home unannounced with the intention of spending the evening most of us can't name half of our neighbors. Sociologists have identified a phenomenon in our culture called cocooning. Instead of going out and being around other people, we cocoon in our homes, binging on whole seasons of TV series instead of showing up for one another. We have settled for individual entertainment rather than human interaction. We, we, each, we each have everything we need or so we think. So there's no need to pool resources. We don't need each other anymore. Or so the prevailing thinking goes. Now, if you want to see how depersonalized our culture is, just try to think of how many things you can do without ever talking to another human being. For my grandma... As a girl, church was an all-day event that included what they called a meal on a lawn and an expectation of touching other people. Today, it's a whole lot easier to do church online than any kind of connection with others. Now, I'm not bringing all this up because I'm old. I am old. <laughs> but we've got a problem. This loss of community is not part of God's plan for giving us his best. We're missing something good and needful, whether we realize it or not. It's been noted, the radical individualism of our culture, got it, has resulted in the depersonalization of our culture. All of our progress has brought us isolation and loneliness, which means that there's, enorm there's an enormous hole in the heart of the average America. American. There's a, there's a longing for belonging, not only in our culture, but we got to own this in our churches. We can say that we need to connect with one another, and it sounds good, but a whole lot of people don't even know how to do it. And even if they want to get close to others, they don't know where to go to have relationships. And some of you are going to shake your head and say, well, that's nuts. No. It's a common experience in our culture today. What we're going to so freely talk about this week, biblical fellowship, genuine community, is as foreign to their experience as the wagon my grandma used to go to church is to me. Or that passage that we read out of in Acts 2 is to the vast majority of us in this room. Now we can, this is just, you know, we're getting close to the small group, next steps, we, we 
doing our normal X2. We could just blow this off one more time as being a nice, quaint ideal of community life together. But I hope we don't. God created us as his church to be interdependent upon one another. We need other people, whether we want to need them or think we need them or not. You were made for other people. You were formed for the family of God. Listen to the scripture, 1 John chapter 4, verse 21. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And it's really, really hard to consistently love other people if you're not ever purposely with other people. We're having this message today because I'm hoping we can make an intentional step toward what God has put in place for us as a church, for the, for the health of the church as a whole, and for you as an individual. We need to make an intentional step toward what God has record, recorded as one of the identifying marks of his church. Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to fellowship, to biblical community, Today I want us to look at several passages of Scripture that can teach us about specific keys towards connecting to community. The first one, you got your outlines, here we go. Fill in the blank. The first key is consistency. We find it reflected in Proverbs 17, 17, which says, A friend loves at all times. One of the reasons many of us feel lonely is that in what friendships we have, there is a lack of consistency. It's almost as though we can't depend on them and they can't depend upon us. And in the middle of it, we got this nervous feeling that we're missing something important. But that's a long way from being committed or devoted to fellowship. In building true spiritual relationships, God would have us to be consistent. A friend loves at all times. Not sometimes, not not when it's convenient, but at all times. I heard about this story several years ago. In November of 1992, a man by the name of Donald DeGrieve, age 65, suffered a fatal heart attack while playing golf in Winter Haven, Florida. As his body lay on the 16th green covered with a sheet, and while course officials tried to contact his wife and funeral home personnel, the three men who had been playing with DeGreaves and had called 911 to report his death, but then they continued on to the 17th and finally 18th tee to continue their game. They were, they were interviewed, and, and one of them, was, he actually said, life goes on, so we had to keep going. This happened 30 years ago. Today it would be trending on social media. And that is just, I mean, it's, it's so wrong. But as far out there as it, as it is for being insensitive and tactless, crass, whatever, is it possible that we ourselves might often put our own self-serving agenda before even people who are close to us? And we say, we say, we understand because of the time that we live in. But a friend loves at all times, says Proverbs. I heard about a preacher who had a guy in his church who had been found guilty of homicide. Approaching a trial, in spite of overwhelming evidence, the man claimed to be innocent, but finally admitted that in a moment of passion and anger, he'd, he'd taken a life of another person. He later confessed that one of the reasons he was most afraid of admitting his crime, this is what got me, the reasons why he was most afraid of admitting his crime, I quote, was not because of the punishment. He sincerely believed he needed to face up to whatever punishment the courts would dish out. What he feared most was the loss of all friends. He said, people will stand by you no matter what until you, have, until you admit you have done something unspeakable. And then they leave you behind. And that's a common experience or at least fear for a whole lot of people. But scripture teaches us a friend loves at all times. Church, 
Are you ready to prioritize something that God would have identify us as his church and you as his child? Then you need to be willing to be committed to people around you intentionally and consistently through all sorts of situations and experiences. Because when it happens, look at Acts 2. When it happens, it sticks out. People notice. Exciting stuff happens. People are changed and blessed and God is magnified when his people consistently reach out like this. Number two on your outline, second key, mutual encouragement and support. I've used this illustration before because I just, I love it. Most of you in this room will recognize the name Jackie Robinson. Jackie was a baseball player from many years ago. He was a great, not good, but great all-around athlete, but he's best recognized for having been the first African-American to play Major League Baseball. While breaking baseball's color barrier, he faced the boos and insults of crowds in every stadium, and from, if you do any of the reading, um, it's not really my hometown, but it's where I identify with. St. Louis, Missouri was, was one of the very worst. Um, but while playing one day, in his home stadium in Brooklyn, he committed an error. And his own fans began to ridicule him. He stood at second base humiliated while the fans rained their booze down upon him. It was like, it was like a dam, like it had been built, building up, building up, and now they had an opportunity, and it, it, it just unleashed on him. And that's when shortstop Pee Wee Reese called for a timeout and he walked towards Robinson and stood next to him. And this teammate from the South who had been very vocally against this whole thing, this teammate from the South, a white man who in that time and place would have been the last person to expect to do anything for Robinson, stood there and he put his arm around Jackie Robinson and he purposely faced the crowd. And he silenced them. Robinson later said that that arm around his shoulder saved his career. How often do we need the friendship of another person? Someone who can simply be there for us. I'm not talking about just those nights when there's an ambulance in a driveway or the boss has fired you or your teenage son has been arrested. By all means, we need people there then. We're pretty good about those short-term emergency things. I'm talking about those days when nothing tragic has happened, but you just had a no good, lousy, miserable day, you know? Paul said in his, letter, in his first letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5.11, so encourage one another and build each other up. Not a suggestion, an admonition. In an article in Focus on the Family magazine, author Stu Weber illustrated the need for what we might call, everybody's heard of the buddy system, right? What, what he called a Christian buddy to help us survive the tough times. The article looked back on the year 1967. The war in Vietnam was building to its peak and a regular stop for many young army officers was the U.S. Army Ranger School that was at Fort Benning. A tough, battle-tested sergeant stood before the young, anxious recruits, and the sergeant told them that the next nine weeks would be the toughest they had ever experienced. The sergeant said many wouldn't make the grade. It was just too tough. The sergeant talked about the war that was going on in Vietnam. He talked about killing and death. The sergeant talked about how training was tough because it was designed to save lives, the lives of American soldiers. And he said he was going to do that by making them face their greatest fears, overcome their weaknesses, and endure what they never dreamed possible. And then the sergeant announced that they were about to start with step one. And there's like this pause. And all the soldiers feared the worst about what step one's going to be. But they were really surprised with its simplicity. He told the soldiers to find a buddy. This is step one, he growled. 
You need to find yourself a ranger buddy. You will stick together. You will never leave each other. You will encourage each other. And as necessary, you will carry each other. That sergeant could have been reading from Paul's writings to the Galatians. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Or maybe he was reading from the New Testament letter to the Philippians. Paul said, Philippians 2, 4, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Or perhaps the sergeant had read from the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes where Solomon in his wisdom had made this observation. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for the work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Mutual support and encouragement. Christian fellowship might be a lot of things and take all kinds of forms. But if what we're talking about here is not a part of it, it's not what God had in mind. Third key. You guys warming up because you're not going to like this one, all right? Honest authenticity. Authenticity means that you're real. You're honest about who you are and how you feel. Here's a sincere question. Why, especially in this place, of all places, why do we continue to put up so many fronts? Even Jesus Christ admitted to his closest friends when he was in need. The night before his crucifixion, knowing what was about to take place, Jesus revealed his true feelings, fears to his friends. Looking at Peter, James, and John, he told them, Matthew 26, 37, and 38, he said, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. And he asked them to pray with him. Jesus was real. He never tried to pretend he was something he wasn't. He was never dishonest about who he was, even when he was in deep despair. In his, in, in his New Testament late letter, James says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James 5, 16. Are you ready to embrace something that God can use, that he can empower? And then you're going to have to be honest with each other. Every one of us is here because we need Jesus. That's not a secret. It's the core of who we are. And it's also our fourth point. The final and most important key to any hope of experiencing this identifying a powerful mark of his church is the presence of Christ. You got that first John passage ready? 1 John chapter 1, I got mine marked, it's not ready. 1 John chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 to 10, and if you look, you'll see that that's the whole chapter. When's the last time we read a chapter in church? Probably ought to do it more often. You ready? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. The, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that purpose, so that you also may have, here's that word, fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 4. We write this to make our jo joy complete, our whole. Verse 5. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, 
we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Folks, you can spend your time and invest your relationships in a wide variety of ways. I mean, there's all kinds of communities, you know. Fraternal organizations abound. We got eagles and lions clubs. and There are more causes than you can shake a stick at. But, but given a choice, I want to be a part of something that makes a difference. That has the capacity to transform lives. The power to affect or impact the world around us and an assurance that when I'm done, it's still going to matter. And we can't get that by coming together and simply meeting on a certain day of the week. Jesus has to be a part of it. He has to be in the middle of it. And he's the one who will make the difference. The guy that I just, the guy that wrote the words that we just read from, John, when he wrote this, he was concerned about what I assume is one thing prior, primarily, and that was authentic Christianity. Because even as early as the close of the first century, some of the, and I've, I've, I've kind of struggled to find the right word, stupor, probably, so, that, that often seems to plague the church, have begun to appear. The vitality, the power, the adventure of the Christian faith was flickering. John, therefore, is led by God to call people back to the vital things, the things that make for real life. And he starts off the whole letter by marking a relationship that is necessary. And that relationship John terms as fellowship with Christ, oneness with him, an identification of your life with Jesus Christ. Now, if you do not have that, all the other stuff becomes null and void as well. But with him, oh, all things are possible. And John knows what he's talking about. First hand, he knows. Many, many scholars feel that he was a, a teenager when he first started to follow the Lord. Perhaps he was, I don't know, but perhaps he was 17 or 18 years of age. And along with his brother John, James, He's, uh, he was a hot-headed young man, given to sharp and impulsive remarks with a, a tendency to blowing off steam. He was, he was probably a loudmouth because Jesus nicknamed both J John and his brother James, you all know, sons of thunder. And I guess that's a whole lot nicer than calling him a blowhard or a jerk, you know? They just, I'd, I'd rather have sons of thunder on my shirt than jerk. But anyway, but later... John became known, he becomes identified as the apostle of love. He became a man who was characterized by such an outstanding devotion and love for the Lord Jesus that all the rest of his life he was singled out as the apostle of love. Now, I've already admitted what's obvious. I'm getting old, okay? Okay. And I have no doubt that in ways I'm not even aware of, I'm pretty set in my ways. But I don't know about you. I still don't, I don't want to stay the way that I am. Even at this station in life, I want to become better. But to become better, I need Jesus. And he says, I need, I require others as well. My heart's longing is to be a part of something that makes a difference, something that stands the test of time. And for that to happen, Christ has to be actively in the middle of these same people in this fellowship that we've been pointing to. I want us to purposely strive to connect to that. 
And I know it's, it's going to be a reach for most of us. But he's still God. And we're still his church. And Christ is still king. So why not us? Let's pray. Father, there have been times where your church has been identified, even by those outside, as being radically different, that their love has marked them in such a way that it identified them as your people. Specific actions. May we come to that time again, please. Maybe, may we be that church those people, that person, your child who demonstrates that we're yours by the love that we have for one another. I pray, Lord, please, that we come alongside people in those emergency times. I pray also that we purposely set aside time on a regular basis to be involved and encourage one another towards more Christ-likeness in such a way that you can bless your magnified and the world notices. I pray this to your glory and our blessing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. One of the things we talked about a couple weeks ago was that uh, personal inventory type thing. This is going to be one of those areas where we're going to need to sit back and not just what we feel like, look at our calendars, make some decisions. We've got a Sunday coming up, not next week, the following week. It's going to be our next step Sunday, and we're going to be introducing some areas that can step into to make some positive change, not just for you, but for others as well. Be praying ahead for that, would you please? We're going to sing a song. I've forgotten. Nothing? 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 We're doing something, but the song is called Nothing. But anyway, I'm going to ask you all to stand. We'd like to have a couple people come forward if we'd like to pray. Maybe your prayer today is as simple as, uh, I don't know what to do yet. But Lord, if you show me what to do, I'm going to do my best to follow. That's a good prayer, okay? So we're going to have our prayer partners come forward. If you'd like to come forward and pray about that or anything else or talk about your very next step with Jesus, we'd love to have a conversation with you. Nothing can wash away my Nothing can wash away my sin. Nothing can wash away my sin. Today is the first uh, Sunday of a, the month, and as the gentlemen are passing out the emblems, we'll just hold them and partake of this uh, 
communion, this Lord's Supper all together. I was uh, looking at things that I could uh, bring to you today, and I was, uh, we always do the, um, this is my body, and we'll do that again also today. But I was reading after that in 1 Corinthians a little bit, and I know we sometimes want to have things, uh, uh, you know, be positive, and we all want to be positive, I think, and that's good. But we also are sometimes get admonitions, or we sometimes get um, things that maybe we just need to be reminded of. How about that? We just need to be reminded of it. And so right after that part, and we'll come back to in 1 Corinthians, uh, but in uh, number 26, it says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes again. So that is an encouragement to each and every one of us. That's an encouragement to people outside the church. Well, those guys get together and they proclaim that Lord's is coming again. And we're doing that now in remembrance of him, and we'll all partake together. But then it goes on and says this, so then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and why a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regards to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment in this way by the Lord we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who's hungry should eat something at home, so when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And so we're going to do that today. We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper together. And so I will read the, the part that we do where we that. For I received from the Lord that which I passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed. He took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Together, let's take the bread. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Together, let's drink the juice. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love, and that we thank you for these uh, scriptures that we have where we can learn and be drawn closer to you, as each and every person here has partaken of the, uh, that have wanted to honor you in this way and have participated. I just pray that they would be drawn closer to you, and we would remember the sacrifice that was made. We would remember the blessings that come through you, and that we would be willing and want to spread that good news as we continue on throughout this service today, that we would be drawn closer to you, and throughout this week, that we'd look to see what we can do for your further in your kingdom. And it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. When we take up the offering, we take up a part of it because the Bible says, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. And I fully believe that. I really do, that uh, a fellow named Jack Rappenberg, which some of you would have remembered as a preacher here for off and on close to 20 years, he would say, hey, I can tell you what you're interested in. Just let me take a look at your checkbook. And if all the checks are to the Dairy Queen, you probably have an interest to the Dairy Queen, wouldn't you? Or wherever your checks might be. And that kind of hit me that, you know what? You can tell an awful lot, and the Bible confirms that also, that where your treasure is, your heart will be. Whether that is in working with your family, working for the church, working for um, whatever it might be, we can tell that uh, where your treasure is, your heart is. And we just pray that your heart would be for further in the kingdom. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love. We do thank you for this time that we can spend uh, one with another, encouraging one with another. We thank you for some message that is uh, bringing that clearer. We ask a blessing upon our time together. We ask a blessing upon these offerings that would be for further in your kingdom. In your son's name I pray. Amen.
Everybody grab your worship folders real quick, please. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but there are, I've got stars all over mine. There, we've entered that time of year where the calendar starts getting full. Need to note, please, our fifth Sunday offering was over $16,000 going towards missionaries. That's really cool. Got other good news right below that. If you take time to read it, we had VBS. We've kind of we worked towards it for two years this past year, and we had some materials left, and they're going to go help a mission, and so we're going to get reused again, which is cool for the kingdom. I wish we could do that more often. Grief share is starting back up right away. College night, the point is starting back up right away. There's some ladies' dates. There's a, a women's fellowship that's coming up at Fort Benton. We're pushing that. Would really like to get some people to go. Uh, Wednesday night prayer night is next one is September 15th. This Tuesday is the Highline Pregnancy Banquet Night. If you can make that and help support them, that would be absolutely wonderful. I'm going to ask you to stand. And real quick before we dismiss, Miss Linda's back here and George is, and Bonnie. George, would you wave your hand? Everybody knows you. Could you that's, see where George is? Just wave. All right. Right where they are. Um, we had a prayer request that came in this morning that's timely. For those that of you that are uh, able, would like to meet right back there after church. Um, Jan Donovan's husband, Dallas, if some of you have been reading this, has been struggling mightily uh, with some COVID symptoms that have turned into some other things. He's on a restricted ward in, in Great Falls. Uh, things have not looked good. They, we prayed and in what we saw as a real blessing from God, some a different type of medicine came, and so far that's not been effective either. So um, uh, she asked that we would we would lift them up in prayer. So after service, if we got a few people that could meet right back there, we'll do so. Would also ask that you be praying for my wife Chris went back to her home, her brother Joel. Uh, some of you know had a stroke and then a fall that resulted in a brain injury. His son, Jacob, who was his caregiver, came home from work with COVID. They both got it, both hospitalized, both ICU. Her brother, even with his newfound, Jacob was his caregiver. Her brother, with his newfound stuff, uh, looks like he's going to be able to make it. They, right now, they don't think the young man, uh, who's early 30s, is going gonna, is gonna to survive. It's on heart, lung, and um, even if he does, they're afraid that there's going to be uh, complications. So uh, if you'd be lifting up the family as they try to work their way through all this stuff, we'd appreciate it, okay? We're to be there for one another. Times like this are obvious. Let's choose to be those people that are there consistently, okay? Let's be that people. Let's pray with me, please. Father, thank you for... The promise that you are always with us. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to look. You are that to us. Help us to become more like you in that way towards others. That there's something we can count on. Something different. More powerful than what the world knows. Because it's, it's you that's in the middle of it. May we be known as your disciples because of the love that we have one another that's demonstrated in a regular way by the way that we share you. We come around because of you. Our fellowship is marked by you. Please, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Closing song. Wonderful Counselor Everlasting Father, Eternal King.